Welcome back to another edition of the Educational AD Podcast. We couldn't do this without the incredible support of our sponsors, and we want to start by saying thank you to them. First, to our diamond sponsor, Varsity Brands, including BSN, Varsity Spirit, and Herth Jones. Varsity Brands, elevating student experiences in sport, spirit, and achievement. We also want to thank our platinum sponsors, including Ephesus Lighting, innovating a brighter future at every level. Gilman Gear, always a step ahead. Camp Mobile, where leaders communicate better. Hometown Ticketing, simple and easy online ticketing. And Vital Signs, bring student achievements to life. Thank you to all of our great sponsors. Welcome back, everyone, to the Educational AD Podcast, this time featuring the FIAAA Insider. Our guest today is a dear friend, Scott Drabzik. He's a certified athletic administrator, and he is the assistant principal in charge of athletics at Father Lopez Catholic High School in beautiful Daytona Beach, Florida. Scott, welcome to the program. Jake, thanks for having me. I appreciate you having me on the, the podcast today. Been watching them for the last couple of weeks, so I've, I was really excited about uh, joining you today. So thanks for having me. All right. Well, we appreciate you taking the time. As you know, uh, this is a crazy time for athletic directors, uh, so we're going to jump right in. We always like to let our guests get to know um, um, our athletic directors. So share a little bit about your background, where you grew up, uh, where you went to school, your involvement in sports, and, and maybe how that led you into uh, your first teaching and coaching job. Absolutely. Uh, I was actually born in Western New York, uh, right outside Buffalo. So um, still Bill, big Bills and Sabres fan. Some, uh, sometimes I'm a little uh, ashamed to admit it, but nonetheless still are. And uh, moved to Florida when I was uh, still pretty young. Went to high school at Flyover Palm Coast uh, in Bunnell, Flyover County. And uh, uh, played golf and baseball in high school and, and uh, uh, was lucky enough to be able to move on and, and play golf in, in college. Played a couple years at Flyover College in St. Augustine. Uh, then finished my career at Bethune Cookman here in Daytona. So I uh, had an had an amazing uh, experience being able to to participate in college athletics and and uh, being able to to continue uh, my passion in sports into college and and uh, I very much cherish those memories and and so kind of halfway through college I knew that uh, I didn't want uh, to go far away from the sports world and, and kind of made up my mind that I was going to be getting into education and coaching and um, got my degree and, and immediately got into coaching and, and was uh, lucky enough uh, to get hired at Dr. Phillips High School in Orlando. And uh, um, John Magrino was the athletic director there at the time and, and John's still there as an administrator today and, and Gene Straczynski, the principal, and they took a chance on a 21 year old kid that really um, didn't know what he didn't know at that point. But uh, I, I was so lucky and so blessed to, to start my career there at such a, a school um, that is so well known for their athletics and their academics um, and such a high, high level culture of success and expectations. And, and that was from the principal all the way down to, you know, to, to the, the freshman student. And so I uh, started my career there and, and uh, really learned what it was like to um, work, uh, to, to work in athletic administration, to work in coaching and, and what you needed to do to be a good coach. And, uh, I was lucky enough again to, to surround myself with some great coaches and we had some great success there. And after about a year, um, as the head golf coach and assistant baseball coach, uh, John came to me and said, you know, you, uh, you're at everything. You come to football games, basketball, volleyball, you're always here. He said, you know, we have an assistant AD job open. Would you be interested in and uh and taking it and at the time I was I think it was 22 maybe 23 at the time and I you know at that at that point you're like absolutely you'll take it and I I became one of the best glorified ticket takers you've ever ever seen I learned how to paint fields um I learned how to 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 edge baseball in fields and put up windscreen but you know it was it was the, I look back at it and, and those are the 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 things that I 
cherish probably the most uh, because John was really teaching me what it was like to, to be in athletics, right? The, the servant leadership piece. So um, spent a couple years uh, doing that job as well, as well as teaching uh, Dr. Phillips. And uh, uh, after four years there, uh, was lucky enough to become the head athletic director at a Coe High School just outside Orlando. Um, again, at the age of 20, I think it was 27 at the time, um, you know, you, you feel like you're ready to take on the world, you know, you're ready to, to have your own, your own department. But, um, it was, again, I was so lucky to have amazing principals and administrators around me that helped teach me what it, what servant leadership meant and what it meant to, to work in education-based athletics. Um, and I spent four years at ACOE and again, such amazing memories working with such, such phenomenal people. And, um, and so uh, after four years there, um, me and uh, my, my wife now reconnected um, and she was living back here in, in, uh, in Palm Coast and um, the job at Father Lopez came open and I decided to apply for it. And um, that's kind of how I, I ended up where my, my current uh, situation is. And uh, Chris and I were just married last April. So we just celebrated our, our one year wedding anniversary in April. And uh, we're just, we're really fortunate and blessed to, to have each other and um and uh i love where i'm at here at father lopez so that kind of catches you up the, the short term of, of how i ended up here all right well no that's a, a great story actually i've been in florida for those years most of those years and have followed that path uh you touched a little bit on a, an important point uh in athletic administration uh you know we value leadership and uh, we're always uh, talking about the mentors in our life um who are some of the, the mentors that you've had, uh, even as a student athlete, uh, as well as a teacher, coach, AD, that you can still hear their voice and, and their encouragement in your day-to-day -day routine. Sure. Um, you know, I look back into college and, and uh, my college golf coach, Dr. Gary Freeman, was such an outstanding influence on me um, when I got to Bethune Cookman. And, and he, uh, he really believed in the, you know, the, the student person player mentality um, and uh, just was such a kind soul, but would push it to limits that you never thought you could. Um, and so he was really probably the first one in athletics um, that I, if he, he, he's probably the main one that I would say, man, he, he really turned my, the, my thinking around and, and kind of guided me into getting into coaching. In, in education. He was a principal at one time before getting into college coaching. Um, so he really helped guide me into this initially. Um, but, you know, again, thinking of mentors, I mean, John Magrino and Gene Trachinsky at Dr. Phillips are two of the finest administrators and finest people that I've ever been around in terms of caring for their coaches, caring for their student athletes. Um, and I owe I, I feel like I owe my career to John. Um, we are still to this day very good friends. Um, and he helped guide me and push me into this, um, sometimes kicking and screaming, but nonetheless he did. And, and it was, uh, I, I owe a lot to him. Um, and there's still to this day times where I call him and, and I said, man, you had, you, you had, you, you had to get me off the baseball field and, and the golf course. Like I, I, I could, you know, I could be back there doing this now at Dr. Phillips and he laughs, but, um, but you know those two are outstanding uh, leaders as well. And, and then professionally in a, in the athletic realm, um, the FI AAA and the NI AAA have made the absolute biggest impact on my career and the the, the contacts and the networks, the networking that I've had through those two organizations. Um, Andy Childs, who's our executive director now, uh, and Russell Wombles, uh, one of our past presidents. Um, kind of really pushed me into a leadership track with the FI AAA. Um, and again, I, you know, at the age of 20, I think it was 27 or 28 at the time, um, just uh, took a chance and really took me under their wings. Uh, Lannis Robinson, our current NI AAA president, a dear friend and an amazing mentor. Uh, Mike Blackburn, the, the executive director of the NI AAA. Um, these are people that just, um, you know, you know, if, if, if you, if you need something or you got a question or you don't have something figured out, you can pick up the phone and call them. And, and they are the ones that have kept me in this profession. Um, I don't know if I would still be an athletic director if it wasn't for the FI AAA and the NI AAA and the support that you get with those two organizations. Um, 
I tell people all the time, it's not, it, our job isn't like coaching. Um, coaching, sometimes you like to keep the secrets hidden in the vault. You know, you, you go to a coach's clinic and yeah, they may give you something, but they're not giving you everything, you know? And um, when you, when you network with other athletic directors or you go to a conference, whether it's our state conference or a national conference, you're getting, you're getting the full boat. And if you need help, you're going to get that help. It doesn't matter if it's from your rival AD or uh, at a rival school or, or somebody that is across the state um, or across the country. And, and that's why I love this profession um, because the professionalism that goes into being a leader in education-based athletics is like nothing else. I think that you can be a part of in a, in a schoolhouse. And, um, and so those mentors and those leaders have made an unbelievable impact on me. I know I wouldn't be sitting here today if it wasn't for, for some of those folks that I just mentioned. You know, you and I have, uh, you know, shared the importance of FIAAA and NIAAA. For our listeners, uh, you know, Scott's, you know, been on our uh, state board of directors. He's a uh, past president. Uh, he's also very active at the national level. Scott, just to kind of, um, I don't want to say briefly, but, you know, take our listeners through that path of getting involved with FIAAA and that first uh, national opportunity that, you know, now you are a, a national chairman. Yeah, it, um, it's uh, my, my first taste of leadership on a state level, obviously, with, was with the FIAAA. And I can remember walking into that boardroom for the first time and seeing people like Tom Stoll and Tommy St. Amant um, and, and Ron Blas and Hall of Famers um, just pound away at the agenda and pound away at this is not how you do it. This is how you do it. And, we're, and, and, and really um, put, put the organization before, before themselves. And so um, when I had the opportunity to get, get on the FI AAA, um, I knew that I wanted to make a difference and be able to bring something to the to the bigger scale, to, to more people in Florida. Um, and after a year um, on that board, I believe Andy was the president of the NIAAA at the time, Andy Childs, at, who was at Winter Park and also our state executive director, um, asked me if I had interest in being involved in a committee on the national level. And, and there was a seat open for our, on our Hall of Fame committee. Um, and uh, so that was about 11 years ago. And so now I have the opportunity to serve as our chairman of the Hall of Fame committee on the uh, with the NIAAA and, and work very closely with Bill Risen and Mike Blackburn. And uh, it's, a, it's such an honor um, every year to go to our conference, meet with our committee, and then be a part of that Hall of Fame ceremony, because those are the best of the best across our country. Um, and to meet these Hall of Famers and get to know them, um, you know, folks from Washington State and Alaska and in New York, every corner, it's just, it's so humbling. Um, and it's helped me as a professional bring things back to my school and, and our coaches and our kids, being able to build these relationships with these folks that have done so much for interscholastic athletics. And so uh, my work on the, on the national level is just, it, it's, uh, it's rejuvenating every December, you know, it kind of falls in the middle of our year. So wherever you go, um, it's a crazy week. And if you have not been to the national conference, I highly suggest taking advantage of it this year because it's in Tampa and then it'll be back in Orlando in, two years I believe two or three um it's an outstanding week and you, there is just not another place in the world that you're going to get more quality professional development for high school and middle school athletic directors than you will at the NIAAA conference and so um you know I can't advise enough if you want to be involved um there are places for you to lead whether it's applying for a committee whether it's doing a breakout session and and teaching and and um you know, giving or, or showing other people things that you do well at your school. Um, or it could even be on the LTI, the national faculty. I just can't, I can't stress enough that the more that you get involved and the more that you become entrenched in both the state and national organizations, it will pay off a hundredfold for you personally and your school. And so, uh, again, I, I, I owe a world of thanks to both of those organizations and the people that are involved in both of them because I don't know if I'd still be here today if it wasn't for them. And so um, that's, uh, it's been a true blessing to, to be involved in both. Uh, appreciate you sharing. That's great. Um, let's uh, talk a little bit about COVID. Uh, you and I already did before the podcast. And I think if we've seen anything consistent, 
across this country is that there is zero consistency from state to state. Uh, some are opening on time, some are delaying, uh, and everything in between. And as you and I know, um, even Florida, you know, we're all over the map. So um, what are some things that you did at Father Lopez this past spring to help keep your kids, your coaches uh, connected? And then what are your plans uh, or what are you doing right now at Father Lopez uh, with regards to, um, you know, summer conditioning and reopening? Right. So as soon as March 13th, I, I won't, I don't know if any of us will forget that date ever. Um, and, and we got the call that evening that we we're going to close school the next week. And we were shuffling around to schedules and, and there were so many what ifs at the time. Um, looking back at it, one of the greatest things that we did, myself and our associate athletic director, was we were in constant communication with our entire coaching staff every day. It might have been a text, it might have been an email, um, it might have been a Zoom conference, um, but we were going to talk to them every day. How are you doing? What do you need? Is there something we can support you with? Um, or, or just passing along general information that we had at that time. Um, because again, it wasn't until late April, right. That we kind of knew that we weren't coming back at all. So, um, when we, when we felt like it was going to be an extended absence, the first thing that we did was we got on a zoom call with our coaches and started talking about, okay, so what can we do to continue our, having our kids engaged on a daily basis? And it was the same. And we used the same pre premise that we did with our coaches. It needs to be a text, an e uh, email, a phone call, or a Zoom meeting. And, and you got to be talking with your teams every day. And it doesn't matter if you're in season or out. Um, one of the biggest things that I think in, that separates us in high school athletics compared to club sports or anything else is that, that we're, we're trying to use this platform to teach more than just skills. So how do you do that? You do that with engagement with your kids and, so, um, and your parents and your family. So we, um, we made it a point that we were going to be engaged as much much as possible. Um, it made it hard because we had, I think at the time, three sports that did not have head coaches. So we were leaning on, on assistant coaches to do that. Myself, our associate athletic director, we're communicating with those teams. Um, all the while, we're trying to interview and, and bring people on during COVID, which was, was crazy at the time. But um, So we really tried to, to just engage our kids. And then as we got through into the beginning of the summer, we worked with our, our diocese, which is our school board, um, our associate superintendent, and, and uh, we sat down as a athletic directors across the diocese and started to kind of pave out a plan that really mirrored the, the federation, um, but has some school specific and area specific details, um, depending on where our schools were, because in the diocese we have five different high schools that are scattered across five different counties, um, hundreds of miles away from each other. So we're very different than a, a maybe a normal public school district. Um, so we really leaned heavily on the federation guidelines for phases, phase one, two, and three. Um, and we sat down with our coaches and we said to them, listen, the only way this is going to work is if we do not cut a single corner any day and we have to be, uh, we have to be very on top of, of the way we, um, protect ourselves, protect our kids, the way we clean our facilities, the way we uh, communicate with myself or our associate AD. That's the only way this is going to work at that time. And, and it continues to be true to this day. Um, you know, our teams are ready to go whenever that day may be. Um, our kids have been engaged since the beginning of June um, in small groups here on campus. And again, we've tried to do the best job that we can to, to communicate with them as student athletes because, you know, we'll get calls and emails from student athletes all the time. Well, I heard the season's getting canceled or I heard we're going to cancel this sport because we can't whatever. And so uh, communication has been a big thing of, of trying to make sure everybody's on the same page and understanding what we're doing and then understanding the clear expectations for, Hey, if we're going to have this on campus, if we're going to continue doing this, which we want to, we need your support in making sure all of these steps well in through phase one, two, three, and so on are followed and, and our kids have been great. They've responded fantastic. Um, and I am so proud of our coaching staff because they have been on top of it from, from day one. And so uh, we've been very lucky. We're ready to play. I think we were talking about it before the podcast started. We're ready to go. Um, but at the same token, um, understanding the bigger picture in, the, in our state today, um, the number one goal 
doesn't change, right? It, it, if take COVID out of it, what's the first thing as athletic directors that we need to ensure? And that's the safety of our kids. And so uh, we're, you know, we're trying to do that and we're trying to prepare for that um, all while, you know, making sure that we can keep them, keep them safe. So COVID has been a crazy time, but we feel like we've navigated it pretty well. We're a smaller school, about 400 kids. So it's a little bit more manageable. You know, I talked to uh, Steve, I know you had Steve McHale on the other day at Dr. Phillips and some of those places where they have 3,500 kids um, and they have, you know, 2,000 athletes. Um, that's tough. That's tough on those bigger schools. So um, we've been lucky at, at our, on our campus to be able to manage it in a smaller, in a smaller realm, but um, it is a tough time for athletic directors. Somebody put on Twitter the other day, I know you're active on Twitter, so as I, as I am, Jake. Um, uh, somebody, I can't remember what state it was that said, uh, uh, if you, if you're getting into the athletic director profession right now, today, you're, you may be out of your mind. Um, and, uh, and it, obviously they were joking, but it's, uh, it's, it's just like being a principal right now. It doesn't matter what decision you make. Um, you're probably going to be right in a lot of people's eyes and you're probably going to be wrong in a lot of people's eyes. So, uh, just consistent, clear, Leadership, confident leadership is, is what we need right now for our coaches and our student athletes in our state. Yeah, I don't think you can uh, over uh, emphasize the importance of, you know, that clear communication. Whatever your plan is, make sure you're communicating it to everybody. Um, next question, I, I'm curious uh, to your response. Um, this past spring, in addition to COVID, uh, we also saw just a, a tremendous um, increase in awareness of social issues and, and how they, uh, you know, impact all of us. Um, with your um, experience as a student athlete at Bethune-Cookman, uh, I'm going to guess you probably have a different perspective than a lot, but um, with regard to social issues, uh, what are things as athletic directors that we can do a better job of uh, and just, you know, being aware of um, the impact that they have? Well, the first, the first thing is, is that it doesn't, it, as leaders, we have to take ourselves out of any, um, you almost have to take your personal upbringing and throw it out the window and say, okay, here's the world that we live in today. And here's the world that we really need to be. Right, we need to be a world of of inclusion. We need to be a world of of love and and understanding and and care. Um, and that's what we the first thing that we did really is we we spoke with our uh, with our coaching staff as a whole, and we said we are going to make this a priority every day in practice. That whether it's at the beginning of practice or it's at the end of practice, we're going to talk about um, something. It may be for a minute. It may be for an hour but we're gonna talk about some sort of social injustice issue and how are things, or what are things that we can do as a team or as coaches or as student athletes to overcome those things. We're trying to bring awareness. So the, the first thing that we told our coaches is, it's gonna be a very uncomfortable conversation. Just, get, just understand right now um, that whether we're speaking, um, whether, whether we're speaking about, um, uh, issues with, you know, social justice issues or injustice issues within our community of uh, minorities or folks from other uh, countries, uh, new Americans or uh, gender equality or whatever it may be. These are uncomfortable conversations that as coaches, you have to prepare yourselves for. Don't walk into a practice or don't get off, don't start speaking off the cuff. Kind of, there's no kind of, prepare yourself for those conversations before you walk into practice. Um, at a school, at a, at a Catholic school like us, we automatically are going to speak about our faith. And we are not ashamed to speak about that. That is something that we do, again, with our kids every day, um, every practice, every game. I know not every school can do that. Um, again, working in the public schools for, for 11 years, that's so not always um, approved, but it is for us. And so we are going to try to use our faith in trying to teach. Um, some of those things that uh, our world needs more of. And, and so we've talked with our coaches. We've talked with some of our coaches. Our head volleyball coach, Larissa Maloney, is absolutely outstanding. Um, and she has worked with 
other coaching staffs that we have to teach what are some of the things that the tough talking points, how to lead those conversations. And I've leaned on her to help with that. Um, and she's just been so outstanding with, with that piece. And, and for us, we've said it, we are not going, this is not going to be kind of a, a phase. It's not going to be just a couple of weeks and we're going to forget about it. Um, we've put it into our coach's handbook that these are expectations that we're going to do at every practice and every, and every game. Every practice, we're going to pray. Every practice, we're going to talk about some sort of leadership opportunity. How are we going to make, how are we going to make our kids better leaders? We're going to talk to our kids about social injustice issues. How can we, how can we, how can we love our neighbor like we love ourselves, right? And, and use the Bible and, we, and use our faith into, um, into to making, to making better people. So it's um, without getting into great detail and specifics, we've uh, leaned on our faith to be able to do that. We have a supportive principal that has also said this is going to be a priority at campus wide. Um, and we, we want to, to make sure that no matter what student athlete walks through our door or, or what coach, they are comfortable here, but understand that we're going to have some tough conversations because we want to make them better, better people when they graduate and walk across the stage every May. So, um, you know, for me going to Bethune Cookman, I, I look back at it in those years that I spent there in the early two thousands, I think I was so blessed to have that opportunity and at the time, probably not know how it was changing me for the better. And some of my best friends and some, some of the best professors I ever had that I still talk to today, that we still go to lunch, um, uh, helped change probably my view on the world and, and how to be more understanding and how to be more uh, caring. And, and, and for folks that maybe we don't look alike or maybe we weren't born in the same place or, or whatever the case is. So, um it's really kind of putting others before yourself and that's what that school taught me. and um i was again i i look for i look back at it and say i i had a bunch of blessings that i didn't know were blessings at the time but as i've gotten older they've come out and and really made a difference in my life so um it's uh it's it's been really great to be able to use some of those resources that at BCU um, to help our kids on our, our campus. We're going to continue to do that. It's not a, there's no end game to this. There's no final score. Um, we're going to continue to work and, and, and it's hard because everybody has a different opinion, you know, but uh, we're always going to circle back to love and acceptance. doesn't matter anything else. I don't care what political uh, affiliation you have. I don't care what side of the aisle you sit on. Um, when you come here, when you coach here, when you play here, you're going to sit, you're going to sit in the seat of acceptance and love. And if you can't do that, then this isn't the place for you. And we've already told our staff and our kids that, and we just, we're super lucky to have amazing people on our campus. So um, we're really excited about that journey uh, of being able to help be a part of, of the answer, a positive answer um, in our community. So we're, we're looking forward to getting everybody on campus and being able to do it more than we have. Yeah, it's just great stuff. I really appreciate you sharing your heart. Let's uh, shift gears a little bit. Um, what are some of your uh, favorite things about being an athletic director? What uh, makes you smile, gets you out of bed, gets you excited about coming to work each day? Well, I mean, obviously the student athletes, are, if we don't have student athletes, we don't have a job. So um, I, I love working with our kids. I love seeing them overcome obstacles and challenges um and that's that doesn't happen overnight um signing days are always one of my one of my favorite times of the year um because it's kind of a culmination uh graduation to me is is my favorite day of the year by far and not because we're losing kids i mean it's it's sad in that standpoint but you're seeing them move on and, and you're seeing the excitement that they have to whether they're going on to play at the next level or whether they're just good they're they've decided that this has been a great experience and I'm just going to go to college or if they're going to go to the military whatever it is so that's a that's a big day for me as well um you know so those are some small specifics but as I've gotten older the more I appreciate about the job is the actual process and the grind and seeing us take little steps every single day um you know when I when I was younger and got the job at a COE like 
you just think you're going to walk in and make these huge, large brush strokes and you're going to change the world. And, and the world doesn't get, it doesn't change overnight and neither does, um, neither does your athletic department or neither does, neither does a student athlete's heart. And so, um, I think what I appreciate the most is it takes a lot of work to be good at this job. Um, it takes a lot of hours. It takes a lot of sacrifice and, and a lot of energy. And, and so I've become, I've come more to appreciate the process um, than probably more than anything over the past couple of years. And, and uh, you know, I use examples of, of student athletes like Colin Castleton, who graduated from us, um, who went on to play basketball at the University of Michigan. He just recently transferred to the University of Florida. Uh, you know, Colin's freshman year, he was ineligible the second half of basketball season. Um, and going into his sophomore year, it was going to be a stretch if, if he was going to be able to play. And, and he now, I, I'm such good friends with his family and, and him as well as a young man, um, because we look back and talk about the conversations that we had sitting on the couch in my office about, listen, man, you have an opportunity to go do something absolutely extraordinary that 99.9% that .9 of people in this world can't do. Um, and I look back at those conversations and it, and it makes it, I almost get, uh, emotional when, when me and him talk on the phone, because you just see the, the things that he's doing. And, and, and so those are the examples. There's, there's tons of them that are just like them. Um, I love the, the interaction with student athletes and, um, building those relationships with them. Um, if you don't like building relationships, this is not the profession for you. Um, if you like sitting behind a desk pushing papers and kind of, it's not for you. Um, the best athletic departments are the ones that have athletic administrators that are out there being seen, making, building relationships with students, with coaches, uh, with, with families, with the community. And, and that, those are the things that I love the most about the job um, is, is being able to talk and, and go out and, and truly um, be able to, to help those, those people. And so, I know it sounds cliche, but, you know, the favorite part, my favorite part of the job isn't, isn't, you know, anything other than um, being able to, to try to make a positive difference in people's lives and building relationships with those kids. And, um, and I know the, I know I've done a better job at that because I see more and more kids come back to our campus. Um, and that, that is more for, for fulfilling than anything that I think I've ever done professionally. Um, so those are the things that I love the most about the job, for sure. No, not not cliche at all. You know, very uh, very heartfelt. Well, Scott, we've kind of uh, come to the end, and we always like to wrap up with what we call the athletic director's toolbox. Now, you're certainly a veteran AD, and uh, now your task is to send a brand new athletic director out on their very first job. But I'm only going to let you put three items in their toolbox what three things are going to go in scott drabzik's toolbox so the first thing i'm going to say is you got to have a mentor um i don't know if that's really goes in a toolbox or they're a toolbox for themselves but the first thing i'm going to tell you is you got to have a mentor and whether it's through the fi AAA or whether it's just somebody within your building or another administrator you got to have somebody you can lean on um somebody you can go and vent to somebody you can ask questions so uh, having somebody having somebody you can go to is extremely extremely important um that's what i'm going to say is the first thing is is just you can't do this job on your own um just because maybe you've been a really successful head coach for 20 years and you might have won 20 state titles but as soon as you sit on the other side of that desk your world changes completely um and so you're going to need somebody to, to talk to and lean on and so i i would definitely suggest that's the first thing is uh having having another person that can come in and, and, and be, be by your side. Uh, the second thing that I talk to young ADs about all the time is you have to be over the top organized with everything that you do. Um, if you are not an organized person and you become, and you get into this job, that's okay, but you need to get organized quickly. And whether you're a paper and pencil kind of person or you're a all digital person, doesn't matter. Um, you have to be your your office has to be the most organized office in that in that school building, probably next to your guidance department, um, because what you do impacts hundreds or thousands of people, and every decision that you make impacts that many people as well. And so, 
um, whether it's scheduling buses or officials or POs or check requests or hiring coaches or whatever it is, um, you know, I cannot, I cannot stress enough that you have to have the ability uh, to be an over, I, I'm OCD organized. Um, you know, my assistant and my principal make fun of me for it, but they're also, they also always come to me when they can't find something. Um, so uh, just, just being organized. And, and if you need help with that, there's, we've done some, I've done a couple presentations at FIAAA in the past that have talked about that. And I would, I would love to be able to help with that because um, when I first got on the job, I wasn't. And, uh, and I quickly learned that you need to be. So, so those are the first, uh, th those are the first two things. Um, and then the third thing I would say um, is be a deta be detail oriented. Um, there's no task too small or too big that you cannot do. Um, it's part of being a servant leader. It doesn't matter if you need to help take the garbage out of the gym before a game or sweep the floor or help paint a field. Um, just because you're the athletic director doesn't mean that you are too good to not do those things. Um, so be detail oriented, but also be willing to, to tackle the big tasks. And, and I know that depends on what school you're at and what area of the, the state or the country you're at. You may have more resources than others, but um, don't, don't, let, don't let the small tasks go. Um, I know sometimes those are, those take up time and, and, um, uh, can be, can be frustrating, but be a detail oriented person, uh, and, and make the big time where you are. I tell people make the big time where you are. Uh, if you got a million dollar budget, you're in the big time. If you got no budget, well, make, make the big time where you are, make the best of what you can with what you have. Um, and, and people see that, um, you know, uh, whether it's your student athletes, your coaches or visiting coaches or student athletes, they see when a facility is taken care of. They see when um, an athletic department is organized and, and, you know, and, and when they have a bus show up on time or they have, um, you know, they, or, or their officials are taken care of or whatever it is, be detail oriented. So those are the three things that I would definitely tell any, any new or young AD. Um, if you can, kind of have those three things in your bag, your life's going to be much easier, much quicker. Great okay. wisdom. And right here on my desk, uh, I don't know if I can get it in the camera, you know, make the, <laughs> make the big time where you are by Frosty Western. Okay. There it is. And yep. How about that? Scott, this has been great. Thank you so much uh, for being a guest today. Um, all the best uh, moving forward with the reopening. Oh, thanks, Jake. Thanks again for having me. This has been a lot of fun and and I uh, wish everybody the best as we get back to get back to work here in the fall. And if I can ever be of any assistance or help to anybody, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. And uh, I would love to, to be a uh, another person to, to be able to help you in your journey in this in this profession. So thanks again, Jake. I appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. Uh, thanks to our listeners, as always. Uh, come back again next time for another edition of the Educational AD.